<laughs> All right, I think I will start. Um, I made it a little bit like friendly, so I just sat for the first time when I'm speaking. It, it will be a little bit different compared to other presentation. I usually stand and even walk, but uh, I think this is going to be fun. We're going to have a nice, friendly conversation probably together. And I'm going to talk about uh, plugins and creating something that can be run on six platforms and see how it works. So, well, with today, the main purpose of the talk is to show you the power of Flutter um, federated plugin approach and my personal experience with two big plugins that we are maintaining, both in community plus plugins as well as uh, Flutter Fire, which is uh, maintained by my company, Invertex. And we had a lot of problems back and forth, um, knocking our head to the wall and things like that until we get to a point that we found out how we can do better. Of course, Flutter team has made a good approach as well, which we adopted and we built also several tools around it. So I'm gonna talk about all of those today. But we all probably know that Flutter these days it supports six platforms, Linux, Mac OS, Windows, Android, iOS, and web. And with this great opportunity of building one code base and one application and running on several platforms, then of course, there are problems that will appear as well, right? So it's not like you write once for something and then everything in on platforms will work. There are cases that you need to go and have these checks or oh, whether it's iOS or it's Android or so on and so forth. And based on each of these if statement, then you need to do something at least. Please. Can I just point out that would, would not uh, run? Yeah, of course. Oh, <laughs> I just, this is just an example. Well, I Yeah, correct. Um, so, but here's the point. I mean, whether it works or it's not, running your code and having the if statement there, it's not a great approach as the project is grow and you want to share your code and maybe with the community you have different languages to support in each platform, maybe Java, Kotlin, maybe Swift, maybe C, C++, Objective-C and so on. So, there are many cases that, well, you need to also touch the native code at some point and communicate with Flutter as well. So today, what I'm going to talk about is to walk you through um, packages and plugins, what are the differences, in fact, and the way that Flutter works in order to communicate with native uh, you know, code and other platforms and how you can make that to work as well as some community effort, open source efforts like um, which I learned in the last couple of years working with uh, these packages and hopefully at the end um, I'll share you a few takeaways that you can, if you want to build your plugin and share it, you know, with the community, you can uh, probably do it better and do not make the mistakes that we made. So my name is Majid Hajian. I'm based in uh, Norway. I am a GDE for Flutter as well as a lead in community, uh, Flutter community. And I'm also head of DevRel at Invertase. So enough about me. You can find about me anywhere on the internet. But let's get it started because I have a lot of content, at least for 45 minutes. So let's see. First thing first, in Flutter World, when you are going to make a package, I mean, creating a small packages, 
very common in many software, you know, many ecosystems. When we want to share um, only Dart code across different, you know, Flutter applications, that's technically what we call a package. And plugins comes in place where we have also native code involved like you have different platforms and you want to share one interface for your flutter application but in fact there are um, other languages involved as well for different platforms there is a great uh, explanation about packages versus plugins what they are so i put the link uh, in my slides you'll get these slides at the end you can take a look at that and understand more but so Simple explanation is that plugins are dealing with different language, different platforms, so and then they provide one interface for application, Flutter applications. But the way it works in Flutter is, here's the things. So you can't really from Dart directly communicate with the host platforms that you're running your application, like iOS, Android, and Linux, and so on. So Flutter has a method or an approach that's called platform channel as well. It opens a channel between the host as well as your Flutter application or Dart layer in this case. So you can send messages back and forth and communicate between that host and your uh, Dart application or Flutter application. There are two different method uh, channel that, or there are two different uh, channels that you can open. There is one is method channel where it's like uh, you, you run your code and you just want to run it once and get the call back or get the response back. And there is an even channel where it's like in a stream of, you know, back and forth. So you open a channel that is continuously running and send you back and forth. Like imagine we have a battery charging status, so you want to just get all the time the you know, charging uh, status of the host, let's say. So there is one exception here, or one thing, one platform that is acting a bit different, and that is web because Flutter also compiles to web, and when you write a plugin, then you, also cover, uh, you want to cover that too. And in web, um, things uh, act a bit differently. So you have um, Dart HTML or also JS interoperabilities. Uh, so we'll show, I'll show you some examples, and it probably makes sense when I show you the codes and examples at the end. But let's see how it works. Very qu quick example. This is one of the examples that I, I took from Plus Plugins uh, that we've done in Flutter community. Plus Plugins are a fork of several plugins that Flutter team has already created a couple of years ago. And at some point, I think it was three years ago, uh, we community decided to fork these plugins and work a bit more on that because there were more platforms, uh, more features that we needed, and well, we decided to fork and add more and more to it. And at some point, Flutter team decided to discontinue their packages in favor of our packages. So now, in fact, plus plugins are the same plugins that Flutter team created, but may, may, uh, way more, uh, and it's also like there is no original plugins anymore. It's all uh, depreciated in favor of all plugins. So what we did here, here is like an example of creating a method channel. So just to get you on board on how these method channel or these platform channels works. So you open up a method channel here with a name and then there is a method called invoke method where you can pass your method name to this invoke method function. And imagine now we have a Kotlin um, or any other language for platform. We have that Kotlin code where we can actually listen to our method channel in this case 
and check the method that we are passing, <laughs> like the name of the channel, and then in this case, like get a battery, here is the part that the rest of, from here onwards, everything is just going to be for the native part. So you just run something to get the battery on Android, for example, or if this is going to be on um, Linux, running on Linux, and so on and so forth. Another example of running the same, uh, you know, the way that we open the method channel on um, Windows, like implementation of that uh, particular, you know, getting battery status uh, on Windows. So, one more thing that is also important when we are sending these messages um, between Dart layer and also like the native code, these message codecs are like there are standards here that these standards, like the high level of those um, codecs, let's say, they are supported by Flutter um, or Dart layer uh, automatically, like for different languages. Here is an example of the things that you don't need to really care about. It is already automatically covered. However, this is not all. I mean, when you start building a plugin, you get to a case that like the uh, primary types are not enough and you definitely need to create your own custom types and, you know, classes and so on and so forth. And you want to communicate with the native layer and the language that you're writing. So, luckily, Dart team has created a package named Pigeon where it, uh, through the code gen, it generates type safe, uh, you know, classes for you where you can uh, communicate with these native platforms. At the moment, uh, it supports Objective-C and Swift uh, on iOS, Java and Kotlin on Android, and C++ for Windows. But I hope that Flutter team works on that and make it even better, and hopefully community as well, to support more platforms here. But let's see how it works. Just a, a quick example here. Let's imagine now we have our custom class here or type. So we're going to make this in a way that we can message, uh, we can send this uh, to our platform or like host platform as well. This is a dark layer and with Pigeon, what we get is exactly what the hosted platform requires. Like it's something that is meaningful for, for that. So through the code gen, so this is an example of code generation for the same class that I showed you here in Dart. But that's good, so at least we can make way more complex uh, types, so which is most likely needed when you start building your uh, plugins. But I think that these are all technical parts where in a couple of minutes we all can be onboarded. It's not really difficult to understand how it works. But what is very interesting is the ecosystem. Back in a couple of years ago, three years ago, and especially in the beginning, like Flutter was like, still some people consider Flutter like a new thing. Still, it's not, it's not a new thing. The ecosystem is, has grown and, and we have so many good things supported in an ecosystem. But when you start building, you know, the plugin that you want to share with Word and community and, you know, people need to start using that, there are many things that you need to consider, right? So... Um, how should we write this in a way that is maintainable? Or if you want to scale it, like if you want to add more and more feature, and if, if you want to like um, open it to, like as an open source project, you want to open it to the community and they want to start contributing back to this uh, platform or plugins. So you can't really have everything in one place and ask everyone to jump in and, you know, contribute. Not everyone in this, in, is uh, specialized in all platforms. It's a big problem. You can't really expect someone to just write 
C++ code very well, C well, Java well, Kotlin well, Swift well, Objective-C, Dart, everything well. It, that doesn't work. And also know the platform. Like, maybe you're expert in Linux here all in this uh, conference, but not many of us are expert in Windows probably, or like, you know, other platforms. So there must be a better way that we write our plugins. We already have those plugins. We know how to communicate with host platforms, everything like that. But then we need to find a way that op uh, open the window for other developers who are expert coming to our plugins and start taking over part that part that they know well and start contributing. And here is the approach that Flutter team has introduced a couple of years named federated plugins. Federated plugins are a way to create your plugins in a way that each of those platforms comes as an independent or independent integration or package <coughs> and then you can you can um, simply have an interface that is common across all of those in, uh, packages everyone knows what's going on there is an app face uh, you know layer which I'll show you shortly and then the developer, the Flutter developers out there, they're just dealing with one package, let's say battery. Battery Plus is an example. But in fact, by installing Battery Plus, they are also leveraging all the other platforms under the hood. So they don't really care about each individual package, but the Battery Plus will give them everything they need for their Flutter applications. There are two great examples, as I mentioned in the beginning, which I was uh, involved uh, from uh, in these packages. One of them is Plus Plugins, and I explained in the beginning how we started, how we ended up. Now Plus Plugins support all platforms, and we also um, adopted the federated uh, plugin approach. So I'll show you some examples here how it works. And another one is Flutter Fire, where at the moment, we have good support on mobile and, and web, definitely. But also, uh, we're working on the desktop uh, version of that. So let's get into the, plus, uh, the, plus, the um, federated approach. Here is an, a screenshot of Battery Plus plugin on Plus repository. So in fact, uh, you're going to have... Uh, different folder names. Here is like an example, battery plus underscore Linux shows this is particularly an implementation of battery plus for Linux, right? And, and the other ones. There are three, um, three um, uh, requirements here. So each federated plugin comes with an app face um, package, which is kind of like, um, federating all of those other packages into one. And another one is the platform package, which we have seen in the uh, previous screenshot, comes as Battery Plus Linux. And the last one is the interface, which is coming across all of those packages. So in fact, the architecture is going to look like this. So the Flutter developers are going to just deal with app face package, which is battery plus an example. But under the hood, there is a shared uh, interface and also different implementation. But let's take a look at that, how we can create this. Luckily, Flutter CLI helps to create also plugins. So we really don't need to do too much here. So by just passing, um, the different platforms that you want to create plugin for, Flutter uh, CLI will help you to create all of these uh, packages automatically and what is needed for those packages. So, but before I get to this plugins and explain a bit more, I like to talk about endorsed plugin versus non-endorsed. There are cases that you have implemented something or someone has implemented you know a plugin or a package and they want to get that to a, like a, to a single package and they have access to the main authors 
So this is the way that we call this uh, indoors plugins. But then the non-indoors ones are like independent ones. So the, the Flutter application and indoors plugins really don't care about other implementation. They just deal with one. But in non-indoors, we actually have different implementation. So you can even install like, uh, you know, one um, plugin or one package in your application for a specific platform. But let's take a look at that. From the beginning, I had Battery Plus plugin as an example. And here is my example of PubSpec YAML file. PubSpec YAML file is a single uh, you know, file in any Dart project or Flutter project that you can define. Um, your dependencies, you know, the, the metadata for your project, whatever, dependencies, dev dependencies, and so on and so forth. And there is, under Flutter, you know, a property, you have plugin and platforms where you can define different implementation uh, class for different platforms. So, as we have seen in Path 3 Plus, we created different packages for each of these platform. And in the app facing, we're going to define and say, hey, now you have one uh, package, nice. So for each of these platforms, as you see here, so we have a package that is going to implement that particular platform implementation. And all of those are also dependent on battery plus interface, platform interface. So they all comes as a dependency here. Take a look at this. And I show you in a couple of a slide more, this comes with a cost as well. This is nice, but at some point it becomes a headache as well. I'll show you how and how we can fix that. So, and in each of those platform implementations, so you just need to define now the platform that you're going to implement the, uh, and you need to say this package is going to be for which package you know that you are going to implement and the Dart class and as well as like the you know plugin class if you have. So here's the case and as I said they're all dependent on the interface. So let's uh, this is actually an example of web. Web is a bit different as I said. Uh, but I'll show you like quickly an example of web in the next slide. So here's our abstraction class for uh, battery platforms. In fact, uh, we're now creating our platform interface for battery platform, battery platform interface, let's say, which is going to have battery level and all of these, you know, getters that you're seeing now in the screen as well as instantiating the platform that you're going to run this code on. Okay. So the good thing here is that now I can create my method channel depending on that. So I can now invoke each of these methods that I need to run then on that platform that the code is going to be run and then send back the result to this layer. Okay, that's nice. So we've seen this code in the beginning as well. Pretty much the same thing that we're doing, so nothing really fancy here. And once it's done, then my battery class now, or any class that you're going to do, is going to create, like instantiate the platform that is going to run, open the channel, and so on and so forth, and then you get the battery and whatever method or whatever else that you have passing down to your Dart and Flutter project. And when I said that the web is a bit different is the difference is that, well, web is going to depend on Dart uh, HTML and you have access to Navigator because you're running that into a browser, browser context and you have access to Windows and you have different way of instantiated access into the platform, let's say. Okay. 
That's quite a lot to understand, of course. <laughs> so I'm not expecting everyone now to understand what we're doing here. That's the reason we have a slides ready. Uh, later, you can go through that and once more take a look. There are many examples also in the slides that you can click and take a look at that. But I like when you go and these are the codes, we will figure it out later. But <laughs> the pain point comes afterwards. I like to talk about those right now. Which um, one of them is now, okay, nice. We're creating one app face and we have platform interface, so many packages, each platform, one package. Now six folders plus two more. Whoa, nice, eight folders. And now in plus plugins, we have actually, I think, 10 plugins that we're maintaining. 10 plus eight folders is gonna be 80 folder packages. Each of them has one version. They are dependent on each other. And this is going to be like a nightmare when you have this big project. So how do you want to run that in your local machine right now? So you have so many dependencies. They have different versions. In local machine, maybe you want to refer not to the version, but to the local implementation, to the local you know, path, and so on and so forth. And now, you figure that out, fine, you want to release, then you need to bump the version of the interface first, then push, and then the next one, and the next one, and so on and so forth. Versioning and releasing becomes also like a nightmare. So you bump one, and then you forget to push to pop.dev, you're going to download, that the version doesn't exist, and the other one fails, and and even if you get that right, then still, while you're changing some version, they have your app face, you need to go there and change the version. It's so many things that you need to take care of. And, if, and the more you have these plugins and these you know, implementations, the more it becomes like a headache. And here is the thing. One of the things, at least we at Invertage realized from a like couple of years ago that we started Flutterfire was all of these pain uh, pains, let's say, of having these type of packages. We started creating a, um, a package named uh, Melos. Melos is a tool that is handling all of these headaches of having federated plugins or put them into a monorepo and resolve those problems. As soon as you have Melos and you have your plugins, the so Melos is going to take care of like fixing the local passes, add, add the override passes, and so on and so forth. And once you're even pushing these packages, you have like, you change something, Melos will automatically detect what is changed, it grabs the change log, add it to the change log, and change and bump the version based on, you know, the change you made, just with one single uh, command. So you just say you want to publish, you publish, and Melos will take care of everything, show you what you want to do, change log, um, everything else, and it takes care of uh, deployment and, and, you know, in a way that it should. That's one of the tools I definitely recommend when you go with a federated, pack, uh, federated packages, take into account. Another thing is testing. And so when you have so many of these packages, then running tests fails and then rerun again. And it's not only one package. I'm talking about like 80 or even in, in, in case of Flutterfire, we have way more actually packages. So it's so many tests that you need to run, make sure it works. And it takes so much time. If one test fails, then you need to rerun that again and we started building a tool named Spec, where it's going to uh, fix this problem. So instead of, like, one of the things uh, a Spec does is, like, when you run a Spec and some of the test passes, the next time you run, you really don't need to go through the tests that are passed, maybe. So you can actually run and maybe sync just the tests that needs to be run in one package when it's changed. So this is going to be also pretty smooth when it goes to testing. Another thing is code quality. 
Now you are creating a package that you're exposing to different developers out there. One uh, person comes from Linux background and from Linux community, they have a different way of writing code. Another one comes from Windows, another one comes from iOS, and everyone writes the way, they, the way that they like and they know they are familiar with. So it's it's going to be a little bit of problematic when it comes to the PRs and quote quality and, and you know, many of these kind of things in your repo. One thing that we've done at least in Plus Plugins and, and other packages is to have a couple of scripts run to make sure we're following the code quality based on our code guideline, code quality guideline, or contribution guideline. So make those things automated helps us a lot. So we really don't need to just go in each PR and each you know, implementation and take care of you know, line by line what's going on. The tool is going to take care of that. So the, we invested some time in the beginning to create such a things to help us to run all of these scripts, let's say, automated and fix this problem. So as much as we can then, in such a big repositories, we need to make sure we are automated. Another thing is that, especially in the case of uh, Flutterfire and Plus Plugins, the two ones that I've been involved, you really can't do everything. So one person, as I said, may specialize in a couple of platforms, but not all of them. So it's important to open up the partnership across community and ask different people with different backgrounds to jump in and contribute. And this is one of the things we at least did in Invertase with Canonical to start building Flutterfire desktop, you know, bringing more into Flutterfy by implementing the desktop version. And that's also a case of Flutter uh, Plus plugins. In Plus plugin case, there are many things that I realized personally, they're very important. Plus plugins, it's an open repository, open source project for everyone. And a lot of thousands of developers are using, if not millions, are using these plugins and we get a lot of you know PRs requests how can we coordinate these kind of things there are a couple of things that I've written here and I like to talk about and I think it's very important the first one is openness for such a big project creating such a you know community driven approach openness is a crucial key here Whatever we want to do, we just open an issue and make sure people see that and for a good time is there so we have this communication open between everyone. And it must be also be very transparent. There is no, no such a thing that we own this kind of stuff. We are doing that fine, but then transparency is a key. So people should know there is like a new change, new approach, something is coming. So and get people involved. Why this is important? Because involving developers in, empower them so they feel included in, and they feel like this is inclusive so they, they come and start contributing. For these big project, contributions is a key. We can't really have 80 maintainers on one repository per package, one maintainer. This is really hard. So there should be people that are taking care of are, are coming and contributing without even ask, asking. And here is the things we've done a couple of times, including this year, 2022, we ran a Hacktoberfest and give away so many swags on top of the Hacktoberfest, the original one. We, give away, we gave away a lot of swag and, and prizes and rewards to those who are willing to even come and contribute. It's a great time, so why not using this time to encourage people to come and take a look at the implementation and, and fix some bugs or add some features. And in fact, in one of the cases, one of our repositories, we got 76 PRs in one month, only one of them. And that's a you know, 
crazy if you think about it. In one month for one repository, you get 76, even big PRs, PRs that takes weeks to, to send. And another thing is, I think for maintainers, it's important to communicate also via social media. So be really transparent and open also on social media. Talk about the things that you are doing. Doing in silence, release, it really doesn't really work. So not everyone is looking the change log. Not everyone is just checking the repositories all the time. But being uh, engaged in the community somehow, especially on social media, will help. And last thing that we've done, or at least I have done for Plus Plugins, was face-to-face -face meetings. If we found some people that are in the community, they're very active for your repository, but they, because they are, you know, encouraged, it's, it's nice to just talk to these people, to just invite them to a meeting and talk to these people and say, hey, we, we appreciate what you're doing. So these kind of things makes the, uh, a strong bond between the contributors and you know, people out there and the package that you are maintaining and, and helps to keep that you know, package alive and you know, be more uh, used by different you know, uh, users. So the talk that I gave today had probably two important sections, the first or three sections. The first section is mostly technical implementation, method channel, platform channels, and plat uh, fl f federated plugin, which helps to like, have an access to different platforms and coordinate our plugins, right? And the second part was mostly about the tooling around that, like what can help to make this a bit easier and the problems that we faced. And the, the third one is the community effort out of those plugins. So they all work together to make a plugin a great plugin. Not only a good implementation is enough sometimes. There should be other things as well. So these are the things that we learned. I learned personally from maintaining and being involved in two big uh, plugins in the community, Flutter community. So I hope that I could share some of them with you at least. And I'm happy to answer some questions if there is any. Thank you very much. Yes, so for Plus Plugins, we have full support of all plugins for Linux. And I think, uh, well, the maintainer is sitting here right now. I'm looking at him. <laughs> so you can tell us if you know more. But as far as I know, everything is sorted out in the Linux part of it. Except sensors. Except sensors. So, well, maybe you can help us here. I think the problem is because we can't really find a device with Linux running and the sensors on it, right? That's the problem. And that's why we can't really get sensors on Linux. We have some experimental implementation, but it's supposed to be out of the blue, so it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Except uh, one plugin, sensors, which does not run yet on Linux, and that's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> the rest all works on Linux, no problem whatsoever. Not only Linux, but on all platforms. I think Sensor is also the only one that we don't have on Windows and also Mac. Yeah. So except sensors on desktop, the rest are working on desktop very well, no problem whatsoever. For, for Windows on Sensor, we have a problem of uh, that was actually Windows. We have a problem of finding a device running Windows that has sensors. It's probably a general problem with um, desktop in general with sensors. Is yeah. Have, I don't think there's a, as much demand. Yeah, so correct. We're actually willing to fix it, but there is no such a thing. Like, we can't really find it. So that's, that's, uh, that's one problem. <laughs> 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 yeah, sure. <laughs> and for Flutterfire, um, 
So we have good support on Mac, I think. Yeah, for Spotify desktop, we have core and all support at the minute. Um, and then for the main Spotify or other pieces, it's Mac OS support for Python. Yeah. One of the things about the Federated for those that have not done anything with plugins and you're learning is if you already have like SDKs for different purposes in different platforms, like you have already an Android SDK, with Federated, in fact, you can leverage using the same SDK that you have and make this communication with your Dart application or Flutter applications. So that's, you don't really need to write the code from the beginning, from scratch. And, and that's the case of, I think in uh, Linux, we're using a couple of plugins on SDKs for, for our plus plugins, don't we? I think one of them that we use, one of the packages that uses, uh, we use in our uh, Linux app implementation is DBoss, isn't it? Yeah, they used to be DBoss Dart based all of them in the beginning, but then Robert implemented dedicated packages for network manager. And oh, yeah. Sure. But in the case of Flutterfire, we do have Android and iOS SDK, and then these uh, method channels communicating between you know the things that we have in already in the native SDKs. No, you're right. Which is awesome. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's only to know that because they can bring their code base that will be tried to Android in iOS to Linux without more forms. Fewer forms. Yeah. I have a question for the general audience as well. Is anybody aware of popular plugins out there that may not have platform support for Linux that might have a demand for it? Places where we have gaps in the web for example. No, we had to say that. <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> is that not running with camera OS 6? Mm -hmm. That plugin's not running with camera OS 6. It probably mm -hmm. would. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to see what the state of that is. It's close to this. Can you get to this? It looks like the battery. Sorry, I, I can't hear it. The battery plug-in, it looked like it wasn't implemented for desktop. Is that still the case? No, it is. Like, no, it's, it's implemented for desktop, too. A really crappy implementation for Windows, at least, and maybe Linux. Yeah, it might be. Well, we have some problems, I think, on some of the plugins on Windows. So we had a maintainer for Plus plugins, and he's very busy right now, and that's why he really doesn't really contribute back to, to the plugins right now. Looking at Simon Lightfoot. <laughs> so, yes. But, yeah, well, well what, what, what happened was this October, we ran a Hacktoberfest sponsored by Invertase, and we got so many good PRs for Windows. And that's what I was talking about, like empowering devs out there, and they will come back and, you know, contribute back to the packages. So, um, I don't know the state right now about the PRs, but I know we got like more than 100 PRs merged. At least five, 50 PRs merged by two person. I know that. So many PRs we got merged, I mean, we got it into our Plus plugins. So, yeah, but if you 
know anyone who knows Windows well? We appreciate to approach and... <laughs> I know one right now, I yes. <laughs> it's pretty difficult actually to coordinate this project when you have so many maintainers and they, re they come from different backgrounds. So one people is talking about Windows and another guy is Linux and they both have like no interest in each other probably <laughs> and they don't even understand what they're talking about and then you need to be in between to find out what they're talking about <laughs> it's a bit difficult to be honest <laughs> We actually had this problem, I guess, at, at least recently we have this problem several times. So people are thinking the interface is not good enough or there is a problem with that and trying to change that. And when you change the platform interface, you're changing the, it's actually a breaking change. You're changing the entire thing, like everything. They are all dependent on the in platform interface. I, we had this problem, but I guess uh, what we try to do at least recently is as much as possible, we don't touch our interface. We try to introduce maybe new things to interface instead of just refactoring or rechanging or renaming stuff, you know. That's the things we're doing, but I understand the problem. We had this problem, actually. Several times, big discussion in our repo, like, oh, this, what you're doing here, it doesn't work here, so we need to change this, and blah, 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 blah. It's very risky when you'd have the interface and you want to change it, then it's and pretty risky. You need to keep this handle somewhere and like, oh, not <laughs> You're right. Another problem recently we also have, it's good to mention right now, is, well, federated plugins are good, at the same time are terrible. Because, well, it's nice, the idea is nice to have the federated different packages, even publish them independently. If you really, I mean, you're not supposed to install a Linux battery Linux, let's say, on Linux uh, for, for, for Flutter directly. You, you're supposed to, as a developer, just install battery, like the app interface, right? But people are not doing that. We still see some people are direct. It's, it's unlisted. They don't, I don't know how they, I mean, they can't find it. It's public. So they do that. That's one thing. Another thing is, in terms of maintenance, it's so much work having eight folders, six platforms, two, it's so much work. I know we built Melos for that, to fix the thank problem. You for, thank you for Melos, it's just a lifesaver. But if, if you really don't get Melos in direct, we had, uh, we've been using Melos, and we had, you've been in the discussion we had with the guys about Melos. We realized that we really don't use Melos properly in Plus plugins, and that's why we had a big discussion. We need to refactor Federated and come back to the previous approach, because Federated doesn't work. It's too much work, to be honest, for maintainers. But then when we realized, oh, Melos has fixed this, then we said, oh, maybe we, it's okay. Maybe we should continue using the same approach and have the Melos the tooling. So my point here is the tooling is very important. So at the moment in the ecosystem, Dart ecosystem, we have a good tools to fix this problem. So if you start using or building a plugin, definitely consider Melos. Otherwise, after a couple of months, writing more codes, different plugins, then you hit your head to the wall every day because it's, it's, it's a headache. Another thing that we, uh, that speaking of these, you know, different packages, so, Recently, again, in Plus Plugins, we had in maintainers, uh, our, our maintainers uh, meetings, we had this discussion that maybe we should get rid of, 
because there is a case sometimes that one person is maintaining several platforms in one package. And in case of, let's say you are building your own package and you implementing all different platforms, then why would you do even a federated approach? You are the only author, right? Why do you want to make your life hard? So in that case, this is also another uh, headache or pain that we had in Plus Plugins. We had like maintainers maintaining three packages at the same time and three different platforms. Really, they really don't want to go to different folders, different class and different blah, blah. So this is also pretty fine to probably merge them into one, have only two package, let's say. One for everything implementation and one the interface. So at least keep the interface separated. So if someone else wants to do something, then you, they have it separated. That's also fine. And I think we decided also go to that approach as well recently. Because like it's, it's very likely if you change one thing in a package, so it's in many cases you actually release all of those so it's very likely, like, at least we have this situation. Especially if you touch interface, you definitely need to, like, publish all of them. So in this case, it really doesn't make sense to have them very separated. Maybe one is good enough. You correct me. At some point, you were even trying to keep all the versions in sync. So even if you change some package, you still bump the version just to keep them all in sync. Yes. Absolutely. It's like hard to grasp what the bump when you change something. The Vermeer thing in Melos needs some documentation. Yeah, we're working on our documentation. That's yeah. my fault. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, <coughs> no, it's no. sometimes also it's if, if you have existing package and then you bring it to Melos, like what I need to do for this, and I don't, and maybe I don't have like those uh, uh, commits for that. They're called uh, yeah, the, um Conventional commit. Maybe I don't have commercial commit. Maybe I want to start doing this, right? Like, what is the proper way to, like, start just start doing it right, but, like, so it starts working, you know? Yeah. Definitely. Feature request, Mike. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> we start with Glossify and then had to then adopt Melos on top. And we didn't have conventional commits by any time. Melos allows you to do a manual initial version. You can tag everything. Yeah. But uh, I, 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 I will definitely accept this, that our documentation for Melas is not good. I think there's some like, sections that needs to be like, put in. But yes, we, we started working on that recently. So we made some videos, more like tutorials. Hopefully they are coming. And we we'll probably write more about it because the tooling is great, but not many know how to use it, and that's bad. So that's our problem. We'll fix it. Thanks for the feedback, by the way. You can find me anywhere on internet. So if you have any problem with these tools or any questions, always I'm open everywhere: Twitter, LinkedIn, GitHub, wherever. You can find me very easily if you just search my name on Google. So happy to always be in touch and help if I can. One more question. You mentioned the package pigeon. It's kind of like support for Linux right now and it's very handle. Would the protobuf's a temporary solution for developers when they want pigeons? Buffer? Proto buffs. From my experience with proto buffs, they fail. I cannot argue with you. I have two of the statements. I think it's.
Thank you. Thank you very much.